so once again, we're, I'm very, very happy and honored to have Naomi Powell uh, with us to moderate um, part two, or let's say, you know, year two of this same session from last year. And Naomi is responsible for developing the narrative, driving, uh, she's, sorry, I should say she's the managing editor um, for economics and thought leadership at RBC. And Naomi is responsible for developing the narratives that are driving the team's economics reports. And prior to joining RBC um, in 2020, Naomi spent nearly a decade as a financial journalist in Stockholm and Dublin, where her coverage of European eco um, economics and politics appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the Globe and Mail. Her most recent position was with the Financial Post, where she wrote about international trade and economics. Uh, and Naomi has um, a bachelor's degree from Queen's University. And I'm going to let her take it off from, from here. So thank you, Naomi. Thanks, Patricia, and welcome everybody to this discussion. I think it is more than fair to say that supply chains have not traditionally generated a ton of excitement, um, maybe in a small group. Some of those people might be here, but generally not the most exciting thing to talk about. But if the last few years have taught us anything, it's just how critical they really are to keeping the global economy ticking. And we are very fortunate to have this panel, which seems to be expanding in real time, <laughs> with us to discuss the Arctic's role in supply chains, both those that are making the economy tick now and those that will be important as we go into the future. So I wonder if we could start uh, by each of you introducing yourselves, and then we can jump into the discussion. Okay, well, good afternoon. Uh, thanks so much, Naomi. Uh, I'm Mike Walsh. I'm the general director uh, policy and planning for CANOR, the Canadian Northern Economic Development Agency. Uh, this has sort of brought me 360 degrees from the start of my career. Uh, I started my career in Northwest Territories in Yellowknife, and I spent the six, first six years there. So being able to focus on uh, Arctic and Northern issues is uh, something I'm, I'm quite uh, happy uh, to be a part of. Ublacek, uh, Tim Brown, Assistant Director of Policy and Planning with the Nunavut Tungavik Incorporated. Um, I've been with NTI for three years now. I was 17 years with the government of Nunavut working on housing and community infrastructure. Um, so happy to be here. Uh, hello, Hamid Shirazi. I work with Innovation Norway in Canada. I've been with the office since last year, but for the past <coughs> Uh, 31 years I work in the private sector, academia and governments. That includes Norway, Sweden, Ontario and US. And uh, in all doing so, I've been engaged with export development, sector development and investment attractions. Thank you, Noel. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Per Unheim. I'm the head of public affairs and trade at the Embassy of Iceland in Ottawa. Um, Prior to joining the embassy, just after the ambassador joined us, uh, I worked for 15 years in the international development consulting sector, uh, primarily in the Global South. So in the last two years has been uh, uh, you know, a, a 360 pivot for me to the Global North and, uh, and the Arctic, and it's been a real pleasure and um, look forward to speaking with you. Good afternoon. My name is Patricia Borg Jensen. Uh, I work for the Swedish Trade and Invest Council. Uh, we are based here out of Toronto. We have one office in Canada, and that's the one in Toronto. Um, I work as a project manager with a focus on the mining industry, <coughs> both from an investment and trade perspective. Uh, prior to joining Business Sweden, I worked for the Swedish uh, mining company, if you will, LKB, uh, for, for quite a few years, and had the privilege to spend uh, roughly half of my life uh, in the Arctic regions of Sweden. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. I'm John Fleming. I'm the Deputy Senior Commercial Officer at the U.S. Embassy in Ottawa. Uh, we fall under the Commercial Service, which is part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. Our, our role is to help U.S. companies enter the Canadian market. And of course, that uh, includes uh, showcasing and promoting the opportunities in the Arctic. Thank you. Hi, my name is Helena Olson. I'm a senior a trade advisor with the Consulate General for Denmark in Toronto. I'm also the Deputy Head of Trade, and I've been working with Arctic commercial opportunities for Danish companies, the Kingdom of Denmark companies, so Greenlandic and Danish companies, for the past five years. And uh, I've been with the Consulate for 12 years. 
Hi, and I'm uh, Kenneth Hu. I'm the representative of the government of Greenland to the United States and Canada, <coughs> and uh, originally from southern Greenland, where I was born and raised, uh, having a Greenlandic background. Um, spent most of my uh, adult life working for the government of Greenland. Well, when most of us got together here last year, and I think most of us were here, Russia had just invaded Ukraine. Um, the impact on supply chain since then, together with the pandemic, um, I think has been dramatic. Um, it's revealed the fragility of existing supply chains. It's also accelerated the push for new ones to support things like EVs, renewables, the technologies of the future. I'm curious to know from each of you how your thinking around supply chains has changed over the last year, if it has. Per, do you want to kick us off? Sure. So I'd say bef before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, at least at the embassy, we've been seeking to diversify uh, Icelandic uh, exports uh, and trade and investment more generally. Uh, but certainly in Iceland, uh, a number of our industries had to pivot significantly and, and have, have been able to do so. Uh, and certain industries uh, did do quite a bit, a bit of business with uh, Russia and, and Belarus. Uh, but coming back to, to our portfolio in Canada, uh, I mean, my view on supply chains, I guess it's been one of evolution and that I've been learning a lot uh, for over the last year and a half, two years. Um, and, and really, I've, it's, it's my awareness of the opportunities and challenges that do exist in terms of um, bringing together Icelandic and Canadian companies, uh, including those in the north, which are a priority for us. Uh, that awareness of those challenges and opportunities has increased significantly. Um, and I'd say it's one of the conclusions there is that there are a lot of asymmetries in information or there's missing information and there's missing opportunities for people. There's people on both, in both countries, uh, uh, when they have opportunities to meet, and learn from each other, and learn that there are solutions on both sides and across uh, any, any other geography. Uh, then things happen very quickly. Um, so it's a, our, our role in that sense is to bridge those gaps, bring people together, and, and share information to make those connections happen across the supply chain. John, the U.S. has been doing a lot around supply chains, thinking about supply chains, securing them. Um, I think a lot of the priorities have shifted in Washington as well to do with national security and so on. Can you tell us a bit about how that's, that's changed? Sure. Um, so I, w I wasn't on last year's panel, but uh, you know, uh, just to, to the question, um, the, uh, we've definitely seen across sectors uh, um, a new focus on building supply chains. Um, and in this case, we talk about North American supply chains. Uh, one thing that the commercial service also does, besides helping U.S. companies enter the Canadian market, is we promote the United States as an investment destination. Uh, and lately, you know, th that focus has been about building, building uh, secure supply chains. So we welcome investment from Canada to that end, but we know investment's a, a two-way street, so we, we do talk about bilateral investment as well, just to, you know, with a view to secure supply chains. And as I said, that's across sectors. Okay, Mike, did you have anything to add from the Canadian perspective? So, so like John, I wasn't here last year, but the, the main thrust of the question is sort of what's the difference? And I would suggest that uh, like many northern nations, Canada has sort of been hit with a triple whammy in the sense that we already started uh, with some, some, some long-standing and continuing uh, impacts on uh, supply chains from an environmental perspective, so that's uh, thawing, permafrost, coastal erosion, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, a limitation in terms of, of access to infrastructure from the starting point. You then overload that with the COVID reality, which impinges on supply chains across the board. And that's had a heightened impact to the North and Arctic regions. And then you emerge from that and you have uh, the reality of a geopolitical reality that has changed uh, a focus in terms of the momentum towards the green economy continues, uh, and now you have this this high level a push for uh, you know finding and uh, uh, securing sort of critical resources and access to critical minerals. Um, so I think from our perspective, it's sort of 
how do you address all of those things? There's stuff that was already happening, and there's stuff that was uh, related to a once in a generation uh, medical reality, and then the world has changed in the last uh, 12 months or so. So from, from our perspective, I think one of the things that we've done, I hate to go on, but um, from a, a Canadian uh, reality perspective is that we, we have new sort of bedrock uh, policy direction through things like the Arctic and Northern Policy Framework that have come on stream in the last uh, couple of years. We have the Inuit Nunugat policy, which is also a, a touchstone bedrock uh, policy piece that, that we are a part of. And these are, these are important pieces that were co-developed with our northern and indigenous partners. Uh, this isn't an Ottawa-based solution. This is a, a pan-northern uh, sort of policy overlay. Uh, so that impacts sort of how we act and interact on many things, including supply chains. So this emphasis on secure supply chains with trusted partners, critical minerals, how does this change the opportunities that are in place for the north, for the Arctic? Has there been a, a major shift in that way? Anyone? <laughs> Go ahead. I, can, I can jump in um, briefly. I mean, for us, it, it, it means that we need to look for Canada and its partners across the north, across the Arctic region, need to look for the low-hanging fruit. Um, I think I said the same thing last year. We're, it's still a priority. We're still working on it. But um, for us, the low-hanging fruit is, is modernizing our, our uh, free trade, the free trade agreement between Canada and the European Free Trade Association countries. Um, and uh, it, it hits on uh, a number of important topics that we both country, that all of us value, uh, sustainability, gender equality, inclusivity, which includes small, medium-sized enterprises, but also indigenous-led corporations and, and smaller businesses. Um, it would provide legal certainty uh, for businesses seeking to become part of each other's supply chains. Uh, and so for us, um, and, and, and it, would, it would, for us, it would uh, level the playing field uh, with other European countries who already benefit from the Canada-EU free trade agreement, for instance. Uh, so for us, it's, it's kind of a, it's the low-hanging fruit. We want to expand beyond, say, 170 million or so of, of bilateral trade that exists between Iceland and, and Canada in our case. Um, and um, we think now is the perfect time. This is the catalyst. We are trusted partners, uh, the EFTA uh, uh, countries. Um, so we're very enthusiastic and, uh, and hope to see progress on that uh, in the coming months. I would say that the, um, the issue of supply chains, I mean, it, the, the 24th of, of February last year wasn't, wasn't the day when, when it started. Of course, it has been a, a topic for quite a while. Um, but I, I'm, I'm sure it has been enhanced. Uh, but um, one thing that we have been, you know, been forced to look at is, is to seek new markets for our own products. Uh, so it's not only us supplying uh, certain countries with certain products, but but also us getting you know, new markets. We, we, we lost our markets for, for, for seafood in, in Russia. Uh, that mm -hmm. happened within the last year. We, we lost 15% of our total exports. So we had to find new markets for it. And, and, and of course, uh, uh, North America is a very sensible, uh, well, a, a market which is, makes a lot of uh, sense for us. Um, so in, in that respect, uh, you know, more diversification of, of markets, that's probably very much the, um, the result of, 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 uh, of what happened within the last 12 months. So what are the key markets that filled that gap for you? Where did you guys immediately go and look? Sorry? When you lost Russia, when you lost that market, what was the most obvious place to go first? You well, mentioned North America. That, that was, you know, uh, North America. Uh, and I understand that uh, we have had quite a bit of progress in, in North yeah. America since then. Fortunately, uh, in the U.S., there's also been very good prices in the U.S. and a good, strong American currency as well. Hmm. So when we're talking about, you know, this sort of reorganization of supply chains, last year we were talking a lot about north-north trade. And I'm wondering if, given everything that's happened over the last year and that push toward secure supply chains, more regional supply chains, we're going back to that north-south model. Is that something that you've seen happening on the ground? Or 
Yeah. Well, I don't see it uh, particularly from where I'm sitting because the, the work that we have done the past many years uh, has been on developing the, the east-west uh, supply chain, the, the strength in the relationships between uh, uh, northern Canada and Greenland in particular. Uh, and, and so the past year hasn't really changed that direction. We've always had our eyes on that particular uh, trade lane, if you will. And uh, so, so only the last year has only emphasized the need to continue to do that. Um, and and uh, obviously there are certain sectors where you still need to look south-north, but for the most part, there's a lot of opportunities east-west, and that's what we, what we keep working on. And this is from the bottom up with working with small companies who are interested to gain access to the Canadian market from Greenland or Denmark, um, and, and vice versa, and bringing people together and making those connections. And, and so, so the supply chain or the trade lanes have remained the same for, for the work that we do at the Trade Council uh, since 2018. So what about the last year has made that north-north connection more important? Or well, it probably has emphasized it and made it even more important. And then it, uh, the only blessing of this last year was that we were finally able to get out again. We were finally able to travel. We were finally able to have conferences. We were bringing people together. And, and so I can only imagine what it would have been like if we'd had a start of a war and a pandemic uh, to, to battle with and couldn't have done that. So we have been able to strengthen the existing um, trade lanes that we were already working on. Okay. And we hope to continue to do that. Yeah. John, what about from your perspective? Uh, just, it's interesting, given our, the US's geographic location, as a southern neighbor to Canada, obviously we're very interested in north-south uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. trade direction. <laughs> but um, what, I, what I can add here is that I think um, when we speak of the Arctic market for U.S. companies, the emerging Arctic market, it's, um, it's, really, it's really a new concept. It's, it's obviously it's not on the radar of most U.S. companies. It's uh, very challenging. It's, it's far away. It's remote. It has a harsh climate. So it. Not all U.S. companies are going to be interested, but um, those that can offer interesting technology or products or solutions, I think they're, they're resilient and intrepid enough to, to explore that Arctic market. And part of what we've been doing in the commercial service is to uh, promote those opportunities. And, and our job is to help educate the U.S. companies about the opportunities and how best to navigate the Arctic market. And, I'll say this, a consistent message for all of our Arctic programming for U.S. companies has been to, to be successful in that market, to navigate it, you must make meaningful relation, uh, relationships, build relationships with indigenous business partners. So that's been a big focus for us. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, jump off of uh, Mike's comment about the Inuit Unaga policy and a big change is one of the biggest changes that, have, that has happened in the last year. Um, and as we're talking about north to north and for Canada, that's in, in terms of the Arctic, that, that policy there in terms of building the relationship is north to north. Like it's going from, yeah, uh, Northwest Territories all the way to, uh, to the Labrador. So it's a big chunk of that, that um, north to north uh, um, network. It, the, the other thing that, that the Inuit Unaga policy captures is that it's a, a major milestone in the increase in capacity for Inuit. It, it's um, a, a milestone event in terms of um, acknowledging that Inuit capacity is at a point that it, it can uh, coagulate that way and, um, and also solidifying the recognition that Canada is having for the, the, its important relationship with Indigenous. Uh, communities or peoples, um, and I think that you're seeing that the push from the north-south pole is on that the that the Ukraine situation has is you know announcements on um, improvements like four billion dollars in in uh, defense infrastructure. That, that's a north-south thing, that, but it's going to uh, play itself out uh, east to west in, in terms of um, 
the, the Canada's Arctic. That's interesting. So John was talking about the importance of relationships. Um, what's the key thing to remember when you're attempting to do that? Well, the key message, I think, from, from NTI and from uh, ITK would be to, to remember that the primacy of that relationship mm -hmm. with Inuit organizations in the Arctic. And that's true um, in Greenland and, and in, in Canada um, and the rest of the circumpolar world. And so I think that that has been a big change overall in, in terms of, it, you know, we talk about building these relationships, but that's an enactment of that strengthening of that relationship. Kenneth, you had something to add. Yeah. Um, I think it's important that we somehow catalyze some processes because uh, we, we are so used to working within traditions. I mean, we uh, in, in, in Greenland, we have our suppliers, uh, usually from Denmark, even from the area in Denmark where this the supply boat that <laughs> comes from. So, um, so you have to break these traditions or introduce new traditions, not break, but new, introduce new traditions. I think it's important that, that, we, that we meet each other, uh, that, I mean, uh, we shouldn't meet in, 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 uh, in uh, outside the Arctic region. We should actually come to, I mean, the, the business partners, potential business partners should meet in the Arctic. That would probably be the best. So I, I saw that when, when we were having this, um, the, these new uh, airports being uh, built. Uh, uh, I mean, one, 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 a, a group of Canadian companies came to Greenland, had a look. Wow, oh, there's something interesting here. And they bet on it. And, and, and one of these companies actually won one of the contracts. So, uh, but, so I, I believe seeing is believing, and, and we need to to actually go and, and, and visit each other much more. And we, so we need some catalyzing processes for making this uh, a, a success. Yeah, I would just echo that as well. But we have, from my side, I have had the pleasure of being in Nunavut twice in 2022. I've had the pleasure of having a, a group of Inuit leaders uh, in Greenland uh, in 2022 and in 2019, but post-COVID as well, and, and uh, having um, a company or representation at Northern Lights uh, a week and a half ago. So that uh, being in the community, actually meeting in the Arctic region, meeting uh, on the ground with the local companies, with the, in particular, the, uh, the uh, Inuit stakeholders and, and organizations has, has been very valuable for the relationship that we have created with them, with, for our companies, the introductions that we have been able to make uh, courtesy of that. And that goes for Greenland as well. We also, uh, I'm also fortunate enough to have a, a, a strong network in Greenland and because of the, the way we brought people together. So I think that is key to where we start from the bottom and then work our way up to the, to the bigger commercial deals that may be made along the way. But to actually create those basic relationships is, uh, is super important. Uh, maybe it's just a good opportunity to make a, a plug for one of the lines of business that uh, the Canadian Northern Economic Development Agency does. So we do play a convening role. Um, so we do support delegations that yeah. come to the north we have offices in all three territories, uh, people on the ground with relationships, uh, both at the business and indigenous and governmental level. Uh, so we would be more than happy to sort of share that, that knowledge with, with uh, friends and colleagues uh, at the panel and in the audience. Um, because from our perspective, I think we've heard it time and time again, it's that relationship building component. Uh, you can't come to the north and not understand that it's different that the starting point is different. It is not like downtown Toronto. Uh, and if you, if you don't come with that sort of on the ground knowledge, you're probably gonna miss uh, some opportunities. So uh, happy to offer that service, uh, should folks be interested. Uh, just to build on this, and I'm very good to hear about Ken Noor's uh, good offices that are available to us. I mean, that's been, that's been our experience as well. Uh, we have a couple of Icelandic companies that have been building relationships over time uh, with, uh, with Northern counterparts. Uh, subsidiary of, of Iceland's National Power Company is working with Kikatala Corporation. 
uh, one of our large seafood companies is working with um, Arctic Fisheries Alliance. And it's, it's, it's not only about um, being there in person to build relationships, but it's about building trust and showing that you are coming from a similar environment, you understand the constraints, and you understand local priorities. And one thing that, and this, was, this came out very clearly at Northern Lights the other week, which is uh, the, the value of going slow in these communities, going the pace that the community sets, and also respecting the priorities that they have. And, and for, very explicitly, number one priority when, talk, when you're talking about food exports, it's uh, the, the local um, uh, food security for the local residents. Mm -hmm. And then it's maybe supplying the local markets. Only then, once those first two criteria are checked off, then they'll start looking at, at uh, other markets, including export markets. So um, respect for local traditions uh, and going slow and careful along with these lo local partners, uh, for us, that's, uh, we understand that to be a really important priority. Going slow at the same time, there's this global hunt for critical minerals. There's this huge push toward building out these renewable supply chains and so on. Economic development in the Arctic has been a long time coming. Is this the thing that is going to sort of be the tipping point that's going to create a sort of urgency around developing the Arctic? And are you seeing any of that at the ground level now? Yeah, I, I, can, I can probably talk to that a little bit. Uh, and I think there will definitely be a, a, a greater urgency, if you will, uh, to look into these type of matters uh, as we are seeing a power shift uh, for the global supply chain and also sort of uh, structural changes in the global supply chain. Um, so there, I think there will be strategies to sort of uh, reduce dependency on individual countries, if you will, um, looking into nearshoring, uh, reshoring, as well as revised offshoring. And I think that what this means is that nearshoring and reshoring would include uh, building out uh, the mining capacities uh, in the far north and in the Arctic regions, uh, could be one of them. So for example, just to sort of build on that a little bit, uh, some of you might be aware, but um, LKB, the Swedish Mining and Minerals uh, International Group, um, have just recently announced in January uh, that they found uh, were identified uh, the largest known rare earth metals deposit in, in Europe. Um, and again, this mining company is uh, acting and is located in the Arctic North in Sweden. Uh, and I think this is a little bit of a game changer, if you will, and an eye opener for Europe um, to reduce its dependency again on individual countries, uh, but also, as you know, Europe relies heavily on import of critical raw materials as well as other raw materials. Um, so it's really moving towards, I think, self-sufficiency. So I guess with that said, it's really that I think more and more ice will be on the Arctic regions. And I think we'll be seeing more and more examples uh, just like this. Yeah, it's really exciting what's happening in Sweden and um, such an innovative mining sector there. I'm interested in what Sweden's doing to ensure that some of the more sort of downstream high value add, not just the raw material capacity, is going to be kept in, uh, in the Nordics or in Sweden itself. Yeah, so I guess uh, in terms of the sort of ecosystem that Sweden has to sort of uh, promote, if you will, mining innovation, that's what I can speak to more specifically, uh, the drivers for mining innovation are really the mining mine operators themselves. They need, they need to innovate in order to survive. Um, and in order to do that, you know, there's, there's, there's a few enables in place, such as um, the triple helix model, which is really the government, the academia, and the industry working together. So what that means is that the government provides the funding, you'll have the academia that sort of provides the research and the resources, and then, uh, and then on the sort of third leg there, you would have the industry that provides the platform, the test beds and serves sort of like an innovation playground to test this new technology. Yeah. Um, just, I guess, to sort of uh, provide, provide uh, one example. Um, and then, I guess, like in terms of like official channels or platforms that exist on a global level, I mean, we do have conferences like this where we get to exchange knowledge. There are some, there might be some research projects on a global level uh, that allow us to collaborate more and co-develop, uh, but I don't think, at least to my knowledge, that there's any how to put it, there's, there's any like official uh, formalized platform that allow us to, for, you know, between the Arctics to develop, co-develop technologies for tomorrow, specifically for the mining industry. So that is, I think, something that has to come 
from a higher level, from a governmental level, you know, put agreements in place because after all we'll be sharing research uh, and, and uh, innovation. I think you described that on the call as the triple helix. The, yes. Yeah, yes. The <laughs> academic government tie that is so interesting. Yeah. Is there is there an equivalent to that, Mike, in Canada in terms of an approach to innovation in the world? So I wouldn't necessarily say that there is something as overt as that, but there's a panacea of different sort of policies uh, in place. Um, obviously, the, the recently announced critical mineral strategy um, also mentioned as it relates to sort of the renewal and uh, sort of refurbishment of the, the NORAD stations, uh, generational uh, investments in infrastructure, whether that be housing or actual real on the ground infrastructure. So there is a, from our perspective, a government-wide holistic uh, attempt to sort of address a number of these uh, issues. And, and the information doesn't just come from us, it comes from our partners, uh, both from territorial government, but also our indigenous partners. Uh, because we don't have all the answers, and uh, if, if we don't have that sort of support and direction from our, our partners, it's, it's not going to be successful. So I wouldn't say it's sort of, you know, in that way, but uh, there's definitely a, a, a cross-cutting section. And again, we've benefited from the last number of years to sort of put some of those ideas into practice. It's, it's stuff we've probably heard for a while that uh, now's the opportunity, and we have the time and space to uh, implement some of these things that uh, are very important for us. To, to jump on that a bit, um, the focus on in terms of picking up on a few keywords: so research, um, innovation, and, and the, the a panacea of different ways of approaching it. We're seeing that from our development corporations are much more open to trying. Or, um, sorry, let me rephrase this. There was a trend coming up to this last year where there was a renewed focus on research. And a renewed focus, I'm seeing it, for example, from CMHC's housing supply challenges, that the concept of challenges and being able to put out some, some kind of mild competition and to, to try and drive some of this innovation out is seeing results in, in the Arctic. In, in, um, where, you know, the, um, that they're small things, that they're, that they're coming out here and there because of those. The, the, the issue that I'm, I'm trying to get at is that there's such a, uh, with the, uh, the attention turning to the Arctic, there's such a pressure to start accelerating yeah. this whole process again. And the reaction, the reality is, is uh, to your point about you, you need to keep in mind to keep, to go slow and keep at the capacity of your partners that you're working on the ground. Otherwise, you're just going to bulldoze or, and roll over them, mm -hmm. um, which is the opposite of what we're trying to do. Um, and that, what that we need in terms of being able to develop the Arctic properly. Yeah. Uh, Hamid, I know you're interested in the enablers of innovation, particularly as it relates to infrastructure. Well, I think one of the things that most governments at least try to do is to simplify complexity, and it could be to a varying degree to how successful they can be. But in Norway, um, to promote innovation and the kind of solutions that need it, usually we provide three types of services. One is capital, competence, and network. When it comes to capital, usually it's in the form of loans and grants, but it's not just handing over money to companies and entrepreneurs. With that comes an expectation of aligning or improving United Nations sustainability goals. So the government is willing to invest in solutions and innovations as long as it aligns with one of the UN sustainability goals. Yet, Norway is a small country and uh, very similar to many small businesses in Canada. We have a lot of engineers and technical people maybe coming from uh, shipbuilding or oil and gas or energy. Uh, they might not have a business background. So, Usually when they have their own small businesses, uh, they work with our regional offices across Norway uh, to get advice on developing their innovation or uh, assist them with how to export this. Because with the small companies, they cannot usually compete with very large enterprises. They try to be very niche and focused on one specific solution. And that makes the domestic market very small. So 
the type of services under competence that we deliver to these companies. One is helping with the business model and advancing the innovation uh, with financial support, and then uh, helping them with uh, commercialization and uh, exporting it. And the third leg of that assistance in Norway is uh, networks that uh, we have like offices in 20 countries around the world. It's not too many compared to some of our larger uh, neighbors here. But what happens is that uh, they usually reach uh, to people like myself who are local, try to navigate the complexities of the uh, export markets. Because like if you are a small company in Norway, you try to look at Canada, you see a federal government, three territories, 10 provinces, some regional governments, and then tens of municipal governments, and they all have their own needs. Just for a small companies, is that, it's kind of challenging to navigate through that. So we try just to help them with um, sense making, just to see if this is a market for them or not. So Patricia was talking about all the innovation going on in Sweden, you're talking about Norway. Trade is about the exchange of ideas as well as goods. And I'm interested in what sort of exchange exists, I guess, between Sweden and Norway, given your geographic proximity now in terms of innovation. What kind of ideas are being shared? And for everybody else, if, if there is a, a healthy exchange and if it could be better and what kinds of apparatus we need to, to make it better. Um, but I guess first Norway and Sweden. <laughs> um, in my experience, the relationships and cooperations are really good. Again, we have a lot of companies that see uh, companies and allies in Sweden or Denmark or maybe Iceland uh, and Finland as companies that they can supplement each other. Uh, in Norway, they sometimes brand themselves as the engineers and innovators, and they very positively speak about uh, Sweden as the marketers, and the uh, same thing with uh, Denmark, because they think they are very mature in their way of selling in global markets. Uh, I had a call with the company a few days ago, and uh, they are trying to bring like um, uh, fuel cell and hydrogen solution to greenhouses in the agri-sector, and a part of that solution is uh, biofuel. And Denmark is very strong with that. And they said we rely on like Danish partners to do that. When it comes to Sweden, on the manufacturing and equipment and machinery is the same thing to the extent that I'm aware of. So overall, very positive relationship between the nations. Yeah, and, and I guess just to add on that a little bit, again, with a mining context, <laughs> but, but um, as you know, PDAC is coming up in, in just, uh, I guess, a t about two weeks now. Uh, and in conjunction with that, uh, we work together with, uh, with Norway and Finland and arrange uh, for the Nordic Mining Day. And that is really all about promoting um, the Scandinavian bedrock and the mining potential that there is uh, for the global audience that we will have at PDAC, just to give like a more of a concrete example mm -hmm. um, uh, in terms of mining. Yeah, is there, is there a good exchange in terms of mining innovation between Canada, say, and Sweden? Sorry, can you repeat? Is there a good exchange of ideas and collaboration in mining between Canada and Sweden? It would seem you'd have them a lot in common. Yeah, yeah definitely, and, and I guess, just to speak to that again, it would probably be more of a, at a university level, maybe academia level, is, is <laughs> where just a lot of uh, research projects because Canada and Sweden have similar conditions when it comes to mining and similar challenges, therefore. Um, so based on that, the research would sort of move in, into sort of the same corridor, if you will, uh, and it makes sense to not work in silos, but work together on some specific research project to develop uh, not only the technologies of tomorrow, but also how to mine at greater depths. Yeah. So, Perry, you mentioned the EFTA before. We have a big portfolio of trade deals here in Canada. Are, are, they, are they working as well as they could for the Arctic? Do they need to be tailored more specifically to, to the Arctic? I think b before getting to that, I, I just touch on the um, exchange of ideas, yeah. um, because there are some good examples that we've we've been able to witness and, and be a part of uh, between Iceland and Canada, <clears throat> and uh, speaking to the value of, of pilot partnerships uh, as an entry point uh, to again to work together to collaborate on uh, on refining products, refining services, and then going into to expand your presence in the market. 
Um, you know, Business Iceland, along with um, Innovation Norway, has been partnered with Eastern Health, which is the largest health authority in Newfoundland and Labrador, um, uh, on, which has a really unique ecosystem for uh, in br helping startups introduce, refine new products, and then, and then bring them to the public procurement stage. Um, so one Icelandic company that has, that's had success there in, in, in initiating a pilot partnership has, has been a company called Prescribe, which has a software tool that's used uh, as part of the, uh, as an as a opioid addiction prevention uh, system or tool. And that pilot partnership is well underway. Um, I'd also speak to another example in the uh, technology space, uh, an Icelandic company called Lackey Power has partnered with Manitoba Hydro in installing, <clears throat> installing its surveillance, uh, its grid monitoring uh, technology in three remote locations uh, on, as part of its grid. So that'll help it, help it uh, uh, monitor uh, ice buildup and uh, thermal hazards, et cetera. Um, and, and both the key to those partnerships is that it's, it's about collecting data, it's collecting experience to then refine the product and then bring it to market at a later stage. Uh, so we hope to see more of those examples come up. Anybody else? Trade deals? Should we have, you know, a, a Pan-Arctic trade deal? I don't know. What's the, what's the feeling on that? I think that you're seeing that already from yeah. just off the top of my mind. These little examples are coming as you're speaking. Um, we, I know that in the past we've, uh, QC has done a lot of work with Canada funding um, and the National Research uh, Centre on this particular link between um, research and industry. Um, I'm thinking of the Nasituk um, agreement and PEV. That's a huge step in terms of that um, increase in capacity also and coordination. Um, to, to keep bubbling up like that. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Um, Greenland, Canada. We would probably uh, benefit from... Um, a free trade agreement between us. Uh, firstly, look into all the all the um, um, lim limitations that we have already uh, between us, and, and try to analyze what can be done. Right now, we are making a FTA with, with uh, the UK. Uh, negotiations is going on, and and I'm sure uh, it would be great if we could have a FTA with. Uh, with Canada as well. Uh, and I think being so close neighbors in, in all respects, in uh, not only geography, but also in terms of, of uh, culture, um, then this is what we should do. And I, I hear this wish from Greenlandic politicians. I'll just, I think the wish is there also, uh, on, at least from NTI and, and Inuit organizations. Um, but again, coming back to that capacity issue, like, the, the well, mentioning Nasituk and mentioning things without giving more background on it. What that means is a coordination at the economic development level with the de development corporations to be able to, to partner. So that's a, one big milestone that, that, that has happened. Um, but it takes time to be able to develop that capacity and to be able to, uh, to get to the next level. So that's kind of where that whole thing about coming back, the, the, the theme about being, you have to go slow because you need to put the pieces together. And we're starting, and by that I mean like the, the evolution that we're, we're seeing in the relationships between Inuit organizations is trying to get to a place that we can play on an international uh, playing field. And so it's just trying to be able to get to that, that level um, in a sustainable way, like in terms of a, an organic growth. It's a bit chicken and egg though, isn't it? If you had the FTA, wouldn't you see more companies kind of moving to sort of fill that gap and to step out. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. you, that's the other thing in my mind. Thinking you don't want to miss the the, the opportunity of a good crisis, right? Like, or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we've eaten into the Q and A time. Um, is, are there any questions from the audience? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Nomi's used to my very loud voice that goes across <laughs> of our office. Um, 
I'm actually really intrigued when you were talking about mining innovation. We're seeing a big push to net zero. We're seeing a big push to critical minerals. How do you think a free trade agreement as well as agreements across academia um, countries could help to accelerate those innovations you see in mining, both in terms of getting to the resources we need, but also doing it in a way that is sustainable it's uh, economically sustainable. There's sustainable development principles but built in, ESG principles built in, and then obviously also indigenous partnerships built in. So how do you see those like innovations um, being accelerated through those channels? Mm. Small it was question. a long question, but I'll, yeah. I'll, 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 you'll, you'll have to fill in if I miss out on, um, on any of the sort of answers there. Oh, uh, where do I start? But yeah, for, for, for mining inno innovation, as I mentioned before, I guess that's what Sweden is known about, like having this big sort of mining innovation ecosystem. And, and I guess sort of looking at it, it's very interesting because, um, you know, Canada has its strengths, Sweden has its strengths, and together we sort of complement each other very well. And I think in this sort of world that we stand in today, we are really looking for allies and partners and to build strong uh, long-term relationships. So I guess with that said, I think, uh, as mentioned before, we are looking at university partnerships. Uh, when it comes to indigenous relation, that is something, of course, we are doing in Sweden as well. And we are actually looking at Canada. How is that done here? How can we learn from Canada? Uh, just to give you, give, you, give you an example, in Sweden we currently have, um, so, so we have the Sami communities, um, and together with them, typically what the mining company do is that they have a very early dialogue uh, you know, before sort of proceeding with mining um, and making sure that they are part of the dialogue throughout the whole sort of uh, pre-build phase of, of a mine site, if you will. Um, but I think there's a lot of takeaways from us also when it comes to Canada and what Canada is doing in those aspects. And, and, and I know that there are some stakeholders that are looking into what we can learn uh, from Canada and Sweden when it comes to indigenous relations. And then for mining innovation, I think it's, you know, just to answer that question, I think for mining innovation, it would be, de depending on what we look at, uh, Sweden has some strengths when it comes to equipment suppliers, which you might be or not be aware of, but that's sort of where, where Sweden has a, has a strength and that's where Canada looks to Sweden. But uh, when it comes to Canada, Canada is really strong in uh, electrifying the mines uh, mm -hmm. and already have a few mines that will be fully electrified just, uh, I believe, 2023, 2024. Which, which is uh, sort of really cool, if I can say it, you know, bluntly. Um, so that is something that Sweden is looking to, looking into as well uh, in terms of how, how, how is Canada doing it and how can we learn from that. But really, like I think in general, when it comes to mining, you know, the three sort of things that we look into is electrifying the mines, automating the mines, and digitalizing the mines to make sure that we can mine for the future, uh, not only for the critical raw materials, but also to do it in a very sustainable way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, I think it's important that we also cooperate in terms of labor. I already mentioned that earlier today, but yeah. I'll just elaborate a little bit. I mean, if we could have um, uh, a, a common uh, market, labor market for, for mining, stretching all across North America, I guess that would be a very strong thing and also motivate uh, young people to go into the sector because if, if you're just relying on, on, on this mine in your home community, then what about when it closes down? Then you've got no work. And so if, if we can somehow uh, have uh, agreements on, on having a much more open labor market uh, between us, that would be much... Uh, well, that will contribute a lot to... To, uh, to the northern communities. Absolutely. That's a really interesting way to approach innovation. It's also encouraging capital. So. <coughs> oh, no, sorry. <laughs> I just said they did both a really good job of answering a very long question. <laughs> It would be really good and interesting, as some of the mining companies are doing, is, is looking at supply chains a little differently and a little more innovatively, as you've even suggested. So they're looking at transportation innovations like airships. 
you know, so green, carbon tax free, not having to worry about, you know, the roads, which are very costly, becoming more unstable, ice roads, shorter seasons, all that, as well as telecommunications, fiber optics as a digital highway, moving data as a supply chain, like the Norway Norwegian project, uh, Leif Eriksson, sort of data center to data center from north to north, north, and using that more as a actual sort of data hub, data hub, uh, rather than sort of the traditional sort of communications for the communities, uh, for the Googles, the Microsofts, but it's cheaper to, you know, cool down the data centers in the north. Another one is the energy, small modular reactors and, and actually looking at placing these in the northern remote communities to support things like the data centers and mining and innovation for digital and robotic mining. And sort of, you know, looking at supply chains instead of just from the south to the north and then as the senator said, rebounding all that money back, but actually sort of using supply chains or defining supply chains very, very differently to support the investments that are needed, not only in the resource sector, but in our communities and for security and defense. So I just wanted to know what your thoughts might be on sort of if, you know, reframing supply chains differently in those critical infrastructure might actually you know, benefit attracting the investments because, you know, we tend to think of supply chains, as I said, as just, you know, things going on roads, on rails. We don't think of it in that other sort of uh, sense of the future almost, the way that supply chains are, are going to almost certainly become. Artificial intelligence, doing that processing, you know, for NORAD modernization, for sensory in the north, because as Peter Norbert said, it's cheaper to move a giga, you know, a gigabyte of data than a gigawatt of energy. So do the processing in the north, especially if that's where you're getting the data from, is in the north. Mm -hmm. so I, could, I could jump in there, even though Iceland is not a uh, mineral producing country, we are a mineral refining country. Um, and if you're talking about sort of reframing or reforming the, the supply chains, you could think about localizing the energy source in the remote locations where the mining activity does happen, or in this case, where the mining, where the mineral processing happens. So Iceland has a very large uh, aluminum uh, processing industry. Uh, for example, Rio Tinto has a large plant in Iceland. And in, in fact, if you look at the trade numbers, uh, I was surprised to see this, but aluminum is the third largest uh, sector, third largest good that goes back and forth uh, between Iceland and Canada. So it's number three export from Canada to Iceland and number three export from Iceland to Canada. And that's the smelting industry, um, turning alumin, alumina to aluminum. But anyway, uh, Iceland made a deliberate industrial decision to basically uh, build, uh, build more energy supply, renewable energy supply than we required for household needs. Um, and a lot of the energy supply was developed directly around industrial, for specific industrial projects and industrial sites, uh, whether that's a geothermal plant or a hydroelectric plant. Um, so I just mentioned that as an example of the type of innovation that others, that perhaps could be a, a part of the solution for the Canadian North uh, about solving one, so solving several challenges, uh, killing several birds with, with one stone. It's creating renewable energy and it's also attracting industry to that clean energy source. The, the, the reaction to this conversation for me is um, a lot of, like, you're right, that would definitely benefit Canada and Canada's Arctic, and we are talking about that. The issue that we're having fundamentally is that we don't have an actual roadmap um, for a lot of these different sectors. Um, mining is probably one of the more advanced ones in terms of a, a, a Canada's north, um, but in terms of broadband, in terms of uh, the Northwest, developing the Northwest Passage and having that basic infrastructure, marine infrastructure in place, we're still in the early stages of that and we still haven't come up with a coordinated plan in terms of what are going to be our next, like what's our first step, next step after that in terms of, or even prioritizing, is it broadband or transport infrastructure? Is it, you know, all those conversations haven't happened yet and so that's kind of where if there's a bit of feeling of being overwhelmed in terms of it's a lot coming at the Arctic. Um, 
all at once, and it's all important. It's just that we need to be able to have that to to come to be able to have the time or the opportunity to come together to be able to develop those plans in a way that matters to the people first. Mm -hmm. That's going to be able to develop that because I I, I, mean, I strongly believe that if you if you don't use it, you lose it. Um, type of approach, and that that really is going to be the strength of, of developing the north is, is the people there um, or, or, or the Inuit. So. Um, uh, how to how to manage this wave, this uh, of of attention of, of need? It's all there. It's critical. You want to be everything's going to be accelerated for that. And I think that's creating that like it's forcing the capacity to happen. But it's also a huge challenge, and that's what, kind of what puts the the a natural break on on getting to where we need to be. Do we need a plan? Mike. Sure, appreciate that. Um, I think from our perspective, one of the things we, we, we try to sort of put out as, as, as a clear message is that the North isn't a monolith. The North, the North has multiple regions within its reality. Uh, Nunavut, with the, font, the concentration on sort of marine travel, air travel, as being the sort of the spokes, uh, not a very large road network. Uh, the NWT sort of sits a bit in the middle with uh, some navigable uh, marine traffic and roads, uh, ice roads that are, you know, obviously impacted by climate change. And the Yukon that has very minimal uh, marine traffic, but, you know, much more uh, road uh, construction and sort of capabilities from that perspective. So one of the things we try to do uh, from the Canadian Northern Economic Development Agency is sort of bring a place-based message to the rest of the federal government. Uh, the committees that we sit on, the intergovernmental relationships that we have, uh, we're, not, we're not promoting uh, Atlantic or British Columbia, we're pr promoting the North and the differences that are in the North. Uh, so the messages we bring in terms of, you know, as you're developing policy, you have these bedrock pieces in the Arctic Northern policy framework, the Inuit Nunagat policy, um, but bringing those sort of place-based realities so that people can understand that, oh, when we're planning to make investments, uh, the North is not one place, and it needs to have different solutions for different different areas. Um, so I would want to keep that in mind. From our perspective, our focus is really on sort of small and medium-sized enterprises. So a lot of the solutions are actually in the North. It's You have innovators in the North. You have people who uh, have great ideas. It's not necessarily... Um, we benefit from the, the, the interaction and, and sort of the trading of ideas, uh, you know, both... Uh, internationally as well as within the nation, but a lot of those solutions can come from the places of which those solutions are needed. Uh, so to provide, from our perspective, a test bed, an early investment opportunity, uh, you then uh, see those, those investments sort of burgeon into, you know, uh, a larger enterprises uh, that have a, a chance for success. Uh, I think that's, from our perspective, really important. And finally, I know I've heard it before, is the regulatory uh, regimes. In the north, uh, they're different. Uh, that's that's for sure. They're related to the uh, land claims that each of the uh, regions uh, have been a part of. Um, but again, from our uh, northern major uh, northern uh, uh, project management office, uh, we do sort of provide some uh, sort of concierge type services to explain why they're different, how they're different, what are the processes. Um, so that allows people who may come in thinking, "Oh my God, this is this is." This is really different. Uh, uh, those are some of the services that we were able to offer. So from a, a, a supply chain perspective, it can't be a one size fits all uh, opportunity. Uh, we bring, attempt to bring the message from our partners uh, to the various agencies within Canada who make the decisions on those bigger, broader uh, points. Uh, and obviously we take uh, some clear direction from our indigenous partners along the way. Mm -hmm. Just thinking in comments I've heard, like Canada, Canada's waking up or needs to wake up, but it is waking up to the north and its potential. Um, we do need to have more visiting each other's regions and be able to understand them. And I think to, to Madeline's point from at lunchtime, you need to go to Nunavut to see what it is um, and not just Iqaluit. You need to go into each three regions and to your point, like NTI is made up of, of the three regional union associations and they each have their own sort of um, self-determined 
perspectives. Like they want, they each have their own um, hopes and desires, if, if I can put it that way. And that they, they don't always necessarily mesh. Um, and that, that, that having that local perspective, that local knowledge from being there is really important in terms of being able to be successful at getting the next piece done. Okay, is there... So if there's more to discuss on this, which we could be speaking um, about this conversation through to next year, um, please let's you know follow up um, on, the, on, on the off time. But for right now, I, it's a, it was a huge group of you, but I think it was a really interesting and worthwhile conversation. And I, I thank you all. And Naomi, I thank you so much for moderating. And um, we'll give everyone a round of applause. So.